um, with Jack Molisani, um, who is always a wonderful speaker. Um, we're going oh, to. <laughs> we're going to go ahead and leave this channel open. Um, so if you want to text chat or unmute your mics and uh, chat, um, that's wonderful. We will be muting uh, for Jack's presentation, um, unless you really want people to horn in, Jack. Um, this presentation is not as interactive as others that I've done, um, but I always want people to ask questions, so you can leave people unmuted. Okay. Okay, we'll see everybody back at uh, one o'clock. Thank you. So ready? Mm -hmm. Ready. All right. Ready. Okay, so we're going to talk about the 10 most common mistakes professionals make when looking for work. Um, content professionals, tech writers, content strategists, anybody in the um, field. Yes. All right. Go ahead. All right. So um, a little bit about me. I'm the president of ProSpring Technical Staffing. It's a staffing agency that specializes in tech writers. Black bags in the, on the shelf. Look and I produce a lot of con conference on content strategy Nothing and happened. quick request if you're talking to your family, mute your mic. And I wrote a book called Be the Captain of Your Career that hit number five on Make Amazon's career and resume bestseller list. So wow. I've been a recruiter for about 30 years now, and I've seen just about every mistake a person can make during their job hunt. Thank you. Okay. Recruiters, either external recruiter like me or an HR recruiter, receive tens if not hundreds of resumes a day. So the viewpoint to take in moving forward in a job hunt is to do everything you can do to make their job easier. The mistakes I'm going to cover um, in this presentation are presented in the order that they're made, not in severity. Some are more deadly than others. All right. Mistake number one, not following submission directions. Make a good first impression, follow the directions, right? These days you can normally submit a Word or PDF. I recommend PDF because Word contains what's called metadata, information about you that can be ferreted out if somebody has not the best intentions. So PDF your resume before sending it out. The reason I say follow submission directions is there are oftentimes a company will call me and say, oh, someone just got ill. I need a tech writer to start on Monday. Um, so I'll go great. I'll send an email to my list saying, send me your resume and a summary of your experience with RoboHelp and your experience documenting procedures. Because I will forward that with your resume and tell me what your bill rate is because I don't have a um, specified bill rate. And then I get responses to going, here's my resume. <sighs> Now I've got a follow up, you know, and plus, if you can't follow a one sentence direction, how can I expect you to document 150 policies and procedures? So follow the directions. But that said, what do you do if it's been since two weeks since you sent your resume and you haven't heard anything, but the job ad said no calls, right? It's getting harder to do this in the days of applying online. We'll talk more about that in a second. But I would say it is quite reasonable to say, you sent your resume in, you haven't heard back, to call a company, ask for HR, if you happen to get a live person said, I submitted an application two weeks ago and I haven't heard anything back, could you just check the system to see if it was received, right? And they'll go click, 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 click. Or they may say, no, we can't do that. Or they may not answer the call. But don't be afraid to follow up if you haven't heard something in two to four weeks because they're not calling now what are they going to do not call more so don't be too shy about that okay mistake number two not building professional relationships build your professional network um, before you need it 
um, both online and personal. Well, we're socially distancing now, but you still have LinkedIn, you still have your STC members, you still have meetups, people are having virtual meetings. Um, if you are in an active job search and you um, meet your recruiter, um, I used to say meet them in person now, a uh, Skype or Zoom meeting, um, you want the person to understand you enough to sing your praises when sending you to the next person in the hiring process. Especially if you're not an exact match or have an odd situation. Um, over lunch, we were talking about, um, okay, refresh my memory, who was it that was the um, elementary school teacher applying for a tech writing job? Um, where if you're working with a recruiter who've met you and they can say, oh, she can teach, you know, 150 sixth graders, uh, six year olds to read and um, has the ability to take a very, take a complex topic and explain it simply. These are all exactly what tech writers do. Cool, you don't get that if you just apply for a job by our website. So when you can, and we'll talk a little bit more about this in the next thing. Plus when a great job comes in, who do you think we're gonna call first? For example, you know, um, I need a documentation manager in Milwaukee, Molly Barrett. I need a technical writer uh, in San Diego, um, Sharon Burton or Bonnie Graham. Um, as a recruiter, companies will often ask me, how do I find people? And I say, well, I've got these outgoing concentric circles that I look in. Um, Kelly, thank you. I'll come back to your comment in just a second. That's an excellent thing. Um, actually, we'll talk about that in the next slide. The first place I go when I get a job opening are people I know, the Mollies, the Sharons, um, people on this call. Um, the next thing, I have people who follow me on Twitter and have my email list and I send it to them. And then I have a outgoing circle of a resume database that I've been building for years. And then I post the job on the STC job board or in the um, local chapter job board and then on LinkedIn and then I start searching monster and then I start searching out from that. So when you are working with a recruiter, um, it helps to them to know you. That's, that's just my point. All right, bad manners. It's poor form to mail your resume to 45 recruiters in one email especially when you display them all in the two field, especially when I'm recruiter number 44. You know how that makes me feel? Ugh. All right, so getting back to what I think Kelly just said about being honest with recruiters, that um, I tell people to keep a log of where you, your resume has been sent, not where you sent the resume. When I submit a candidate, I'll send three things. I'll send your resume, a summary of how your experience matches the job requirements and what your salary expectations are or bill rate if you're a contractor. Um, so I had a candidate, spent time doing this, I submitted them and the hiring manager tells me, oh, he sent me his resume himself two hours ago. So I called the candidate back and I said, why didn't you tell me you already sent your resume there? He goes, well, I can't remember every place I send my resume. I go, yes, you can. It's called writing. So if you are working, you are more than welcome to submit uh, work with multiple recruiters. Totally fine. Just, again, be truthful um, because if you're working with multiple agents and they both submit you for the same job, there's a thing called the agency of record, which means whoever submits you first gets credit for submitting you. However, some recruiters will argue or um, contest that. So some companies just to avoid the possibility of something contentious will throw your resume out and not consider you at all. So if somebody calls you about a job and sounds suspiciously like a job somebody else has already called you out, then uh, to let them know if it's for XYZ company, I've already been submitted. Now you can't do that if somebody just grabs your resume off Monster or Dice and sends it to the, their client. But again, in that case, that's not your fault. 
All right. Don't insult the recruiter. I'm not kidding. It happens. And I'm going to share an email with you. Just read this real quick. If I do business with you, it cannot be your job to interpret my resume or to certify if I qualify for a job or where I ask you to submit, send the resume. I don't have time to explain or to you the things that I know in relation to a client's job description. You'd be getting in the way and wasting time. Also, educated writers are not limited by their education or experience about what they start to write. You might be referring to the new age dumb downs, the itsy pitsy poos of the writing world called word processing people who pretend to be technical writers. I come along and have to clean up their blankety blank text. Their being able to use a piece of software as an expert is not the same as being educated. It seems like by your name, me, foreign born, your writing ability and writing comprehension, you have trouble with the English language and its semantics. Uh, what? And you want me to find you a job? Yeah, don't do that. All right. All right, let me look in the chat box. I'm gonna check real quick. This is slowly, awfully slow. Is anybody there with a question that can read it to me, if there is one? All right. Um, a call for applicants are made with no intention to hire at the time. Um, <sighs> They could be yeah. or making a show of looking externally, but they've got someone else in mind. I was just victim to this about a month ago. Um, one of our clients that we recently re um, was dormant for a while, we activated them. And we had a very specific thing they were looking for. And uh, we found a perfect candidate, submitted them, and then they went silent didn't return calls, didn't return emails. And one can assume, can't prove it, but one can assume that they only did that because they have an internal requirement to interview at least two or three people and they already knew who they wanted to hire, but she just needed a couple extra resumes. Yeah, it happens. Doesn't happen often, I think, but it does happen. Any other chats? Um, Allison wants to ask, did you respond to that beautiful and wonderful email? And is you it know, I just forwarded to every recruiter I know and called it Bozo Alert. <laughs> yeah, I'm not to say we blackballed him, but just be on the lookout for this guy. Um, and I've got other res I've got other emails like this. Oh my God. Um, I don't know. Either somebody's on their meds and they're not supposed to be, or not on that are supposed to be. I don't know. But just yeah, amazing. Um, this whole internet anonymity thing is just kind of scary. Trolls. We didn't even have a word for them I mean, back in the, you know, internet trolls, but no. All right. Any other questions so far? No. By the way. You. Okay, good. So um, in case I forget to say it, because I'm a professional recruiter, um, feel free at the end of the presentation to ask any question you want um, or email me if you're a little too shy to ask it in a group environment, because this is the one time you actually get to talk to a hiring manager or hiring recruiter. Um, so let's keep this interactive. Let's go on, number four. Biggest error I see these days are being blocked by applicant tracking systems. An ATS is when you apply for a job on a company's website. It's not just taking your resume. Oftentimes they use artificial intelligence to compare your resume to the job description and using some sort of algorithm, rank you, and then only sends on the top 10 or 20% to HR. So I heard a statistic like at SAP, they'll, they'll, they'll post a job these days and they get 150 to 1,000 applicants. Um, so they have to have some way to cut, to weed that out. My problem is, let me talk more about this, is that um, you don't know what al algorithm you're, they're using. You don't know. Uh, you could be the best person, but again, there are certain, like our oh, uh, grade school teacher example, the core competencies for tech writers, critical thinking skills, um, 
clearly communicating, um, evaluation of importances. These are all skills that you can transfer from one field to another. But if an applicant tracking system is just looking for keyword matches, that's how, how do you beat that? So you cut out a couple options. First of all, I say don't apply for a job via a website or by sending your email to job that black hole never to be heard again from again.com. Make a personal connection. Two suggestions. One, I use LinkedIn a lot. So say you're applying for a job as a tech writer at John Deere Tractor in Houston. Well, go on LinkedIn, see if you can find a tech writer at John Deere Tractor in Houston and say, hey, I see you have a job opening. Would you mind passing my resume along? That does a couple of things. One, they may get a bonus out of it. Two, you get a personal referral. And three, you're not just one of 150 applicants sitting in an email that hasn't even been looked at, right? And even if you don't send that person um, to, to a real person um, in that department to get a hold of the hiring manager, you can even find the hiring manager on LinkedIn probably, um, they may, if you say, may I send you a resume, they go, no, apply for the job via the website and I'll keep an eye out for it. And well, if nothing else, now they're keeping an eye out for you, um, which makes you rise to the top of the heap. Okay. And if nothing else, 99.9% .9 of companies do not list their HR contact on their website, but 99.9% .9 of recruiters have a LinkedIn profile because we use LinkedIn to recruit right and find people so reach out to a recruiter at john deere tractor and say hey i see there's an opening in houston may i send you a resume they may not reply they may say yes they may say email it to me they may say put it apply online and we'll i'll look for it but still it's better than just emailing your resume and hope that someday someone will call you back now another thing you can do is all right say you are absolutely forced to apply for a job through an applicant tracking system. Um, there are websites that will help you, you, you paste in the job description you're applying for or for which you are applying for your grammarians. And then you type in your, or you're pasting your resume and the website AI does the comparison. And someone was just telling me yesterday on a, another virtual meeting that she was, she did this, used one of these, jobscan.co and she was getting a really low score because her the job was UX slash UI, which is user experience slash um, user interface designer, UX UI designer. And in, in her resume, she had UI slash UX designer. And that was a big enough difference to say, oh, you don't match this job. It drives me crazy if, you know, and if you can, any way of it, avoid applying for a job to an applicant tracking system and try to do it through a personal connection. All right, now, um, Pamela Patterson, STC member, wrote a book on how to optimize your resume for the online job search. Um, I have not read her book. I only know of it, um, but uh, you can go on Amazon and do a quick peek and see if it's um, worth reading. It's just another resource. So I'm gonna go back a page. So you've got, there are multiple websites, just search, you know, does my resume match this job on Google or other search engine and you will find these. Um, I'm gonna pause here and let's open the door to, for questions because how to get past an applicant tracking system is one of the biggest barriers we're seeing these days. Uh, Jack, this is Stacy. I'll just uh, talk. Um, so uh, at Boeing, I went through about a year of trying to look for work, and I have been lucky other than that year I've, I've been employed. Um, but what an eye-opener that was. I, I, that, I, I guess the last time I had looked for work, I was able to pick up the phone and talk to somebody or talk to them in person. And you're right, it's very difficult to do that. And I really struggled with the application um, tracking systems 
and um, I never seemed to be able to match it. And so I, I really value what you, you had to say here. I think it's uh, incredibly valuable information. The one thing that one manager did tell me that I didn't think about, um, the hard part for me is if you are stuck using the application tracking system, uh, what he did, um, I, I put in you know all the keywords, but when you do that, your resume might be readable for the application system, but it's not readable to a person who actually is gonna hire you. Um, and so I struggled with, well, how do you get around that? And what he did is he took all the keywords, but he just put them in the footer of his resume and made them white so that the application system would pick up on the words, um, yes. but they wouldn't show up in your resume. Yeah. I didn't think of that. I thought it was a great idea. Yeah. Um, another thing you can do is at the end of your resume, just say keyword search for search engine optimization and just list them and just be bold and brazen saying, this is my keywords, this is why it's here. Um, yeah, absolutely. Oh, interesting. Um, but again, when possible, just find some way to get through to a live person. Um, so, all right. Uh, Jack, can I just ask your opinion on this? I'm really curious from a recruiter's standpoint. When I went through that job search process, I was thinking, wow, things seem really broken on my side as, an, as a job applicant. But what do you see on the other side? Do you see kind of broken pieces on the other side with managers trying to find good candidates for jobs? Oddly enough, yes. Um, one of the things I'll talk later about in the, this presentation, but I'll bring it up now, is there is a datum that um, we recruiters, anytime we post a job, um, we probably get, if we get 100 resumes, 99 of them are not qualified for the job, especially these days. Things, the some of the um, platforms like Indeed, um, where candidates can upload a resume, and then if they see a job they like, all they do is hit their phone and go, apply, apply, apply. Or if there's a keyword, you can set up an automated bot that if this word appears, apply for the job, send my resume. Um, or in my earlier example, I'll go, send me your resume, uh, a summary of your experience with such and such and your bill rate and they go here's my here's my resume and you go oh um so that's a challenge for both the hiring manager a recruiter and the person applying for the job because if you don't show in the first sentence or two that you match what the reader's looking for and by the way i've got another whole presentation on resumes if you want we can do it for the chapter another time but I have dis discovered that the definition of resume is lacking most definitions uh, like Webster says it's a summary of your experience that shows um, what you've done when applying for a job and somewhere along the way I realized that what a person is doing when they read their re your resume is scanning it to see if you match what they're looking for. So really, all a resume is is a vehicle that shows that you match what the reader's looking for, and that's all it is. Um, and mm -hmm. once I found that fundamental datum, it made life so much easier. You can run any question about your job search through that filter. For example, if the question is, how long should my resume be? Some people say one page, some people say two. My answer is, well, if a resume is a vehicle that shows that you match what the reader's looking for, or for what the reader's looking, um, the resume should be long enough to show that you match what they're looking for. If you can do it in a page, do it in a page. If it takes two, take two. Um, and use that as part of your job search. Um, I, I went off a bit of a tangent there. Did that answer the question? Uh, yes, you did. Thank you. Okay. So okay. let's continue. Oh, uh, go ahead. What about, sorry, yes, what about um, if you're an older worker, how far back in your um, history do you go?
go so that they'll even consider you in, ten in terms of 10 years if, if that there's one job yeah. there is age discrimination out there there just is um i'm not going to sugarcoat that so one i don't want to see 40 years worth of your experience plus what you were doing 40 years ago doesn't really is not really that applicable these days you know when i was a tech writer i started with yellow pads in a typing pool on wang um that just it's not applicable um so first thing you should do to get around the age discrimination is um take the date off your college degrees um i don't need to know when you got your degree um and then show me about eh, maybe the past 10 years experience and you can then say additional experience prior to 1999 or whatever year you stop at um now if they're truly age discriminatory and you go in for the interview and they go <gasps> and they go thank you very much for coming have a nice day well you don't want to work there anyways but at least you can get around that initial culling of resumes based on your age okay okay thank you all right uh, excellent questions uh, uh, this is Stacy. Can I can I just add on to what you said here? Please. Um, I was um, so sometimes some of my experience early in my career is quite valuable. It doesn't have to do with something, maybe a system. It might be more a soft skill. And mm -hmm. so the way that I've tried to present that is, I'll just put it at the top of my resume if it applies to the the job I'm looking for um, in like a highlights of qualifications so that it doesn't have a date associated with it. Correct. I know that it's coming from way back, but they don't have to know that. Yes, absolutely. I agree with that 100%. Another thing that I used to do, um, I was a contract technical writer before starting my own agency. And I just said, you know, from 1990 present, independent contractor working on contracts such as and then I listed the most applicable contracts for the job for which I was applying. Um, I really didn't need to know what date, from what month to what month did I do this contract at this company. It was more important that I did it. Um, another thing I would do is I added a, a second page to my resume. At the time, I had a one-page resume listing sample projects and then just listed all the projects that I've done that are again were most applicable for the job for which I was applying. So if I was applying for consumer electronics documentation, I listed all my consumer documentation. If it was an API job, I listed all my API, which is an application program interface. It's a way of documenting how databases talk to each other. Um, but yeah, definitely make sure again, if it shows that you match the what the reader's looking for, put it at the top of your resume. Absolutely. Any other suggestions from the, the crowd? Okay, let's carry on. So at this point, I'm going to assume that you took Jack's advice and are applying for a job through a real person. The next mistake is not summarizing how your experience matches the job requirements. Not all recruiters have the time to read your resume from top to bottom. Many just skim for keywords. They can't possibly understand what makes you a good tech writer or whatever it is that you do, as well as you do, right? So again, and you really want somebody who's not a professional tech writer deciding if you're good enough to pass on, because probably the person's reading your resume is somebody in HR, maybe a temp, and they don't know structured authoring from a hole in the ground. So be proactive. Send a summary of how your experience matches each of the job requirements. All right, I'm gonna stop here for a second. So what I would do and when applying for a job, I'm saying perfect cover letter. Oh my God, this is not part of the slides, but cover letters are the worst, especially when, oh dear honorable person looking for a company that will nurture me and give me the opportunity to spread my wings, blah, 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 blah. No. It's, we don't want to care what you're looking for. What we want to know is how do you match what we're looking for, right? So a perfect cover letter is, dear company, I'm applying for job one, two, three, four, five. Here's a summary of how my experience matches the job requirements. You want five years experience as a tech writer? I have 10. You want experience doing conditional text? I've taught 
conditional text at the STC level. You want a degree in an applicable field? My degree is in nuclear physics. I'm available at this phone number for an interview. Sincerely, me. Done. Simple. You can either do that in a matrix. You can do it as here's your requirement, here's my experience, and just do it. You know, bold their you know, use good information architecture, use technical writing practices, use white space. Again, you're talking to a live person now, not an applicant tracking system, right? And if you don't have one of the requirements, this is where you say, well, I don't have FrameMaker, but I've got 10 years experience with PageMaker, a similar design tool, all right? Um, this one thing alone will get you to the next step of the interview process. Um, because all I have to do is go read your, your cover letter, go, yep, 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 has everything I'm looking for, off you go. All right, now, question I get is how this is again one of those 99% of the people cover letters are not worth reading so we don't read them so a little trick I discovered early on is to take this summary or this cover letter and make it the first page of your resume so even if they scroll past it at least their eyeballs hit it and they may scroll back up and read it 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 increases your chances of them reading your cover letter exponentially, okay? So, assuming you've done that, suddenly the recruiters love you. First, I didn't have to search for the information in your resume. You type the summary for me because if I'm a good recruiter, I'm gonna send that summary anyways. You pointed out important information that I may have missed, and all I had to do is verify the information and pass it on. Oh my God, ding, 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 off you go. Okay, just remember my first slide, your job is to make the job, HR person's job as easy as possible. And this is the best way you have to do it. That and making sure the information shows up early in your resume. Okay. Can I ask on uh, cover letters like that, um, like using um, even bullet points or a list or something like that within the cover letter, is that a good recommended practice or should you just kind of focus on just the summary itself either or um the reason i hesitated there is has anyone ever gone on a job interview and found what they were looking for was nothing <laughs> like the job description they posted online happens all the time um so it's funny like when say technical writer needed must know frame maker and robo help and that's the only two requirements. Well, say you're applying for this job at John Deere Tractor and you've got experience doing industrial documentation. Well, then I wouldn't point that out. Dear sir, I'm applying for your job for technical writer. I have 10 plus years of technical writing, nine plus years doing instructional documentation with a degree in mechanical engineering. Oh my God, those weren't even in the job requirements, but I definitely want to point that out because again, a cover letter, just like a resume, is just a vehicle that shows that you match what they're read, looking for. And they may not know that having domain knowledge experience in your field is something they should have as a tech writer. Now, granted, we are constantly documenting things that don't exist yet, but it helps. If you're in the biotech field, it helps to have a degree in biology or microbiology. Um, if you are documenting networks, it has value to have a certificate in network uh, administration, which by the way, if anyone's thinking about going back to school or in, taking some classes during the, the stay at home phase, um, now this is heresy for some people in tech writing, where some people would say, we'll take, you know, get a master's in tech writing. I advocate, don't get a master's in technical writing, get a certificate in a field in which you wanna work. Database management, network management, infectious disease management, public health, any place that tech writers, people are gonna need tech role writing, they want you to have experience in their domain. So take classes, take a programming class, um, take a web building class, um, learn WordPress, anything that can help you gain domain knowledge in addition to your technical writing knowledge, okay? Anybody have comments, questions, changes of viewpoint? 
Hey, Jack, I've got one question here. Um, I was just wondering, uh, approaching this from a career changer perspective, um, is it always beneficial to write a summary? Is there times where you might want to consider an objective instead of a summary? Um, what do you think on that? Again, thank you for the question, Cody. Um, the keep in mind the whoever's reading your resume is reading it to verify that you match what they are looking for. So mm -hmm. it really should be a summary of how you match what they're looking for, even if you haven't done it exactly. Um, so yes, you can have objective, especially if you're looking for a contract assignment, objective, contract technical writing assignment or full-time technical writing assignment. Um, but then list how you match that. In my resume, um, I at the top of my resume, I said, Jack Malasani, technical writer. So you don't even have to read the rest of my resume, know what I did, boom. Now, this is where it gets a little tricky because what if the company is looking for an information architect or a knowledge engineer, right? Um, um, so then, you again, you need to say, I'm looking for a knowledge engineering job. <laughs> Um, it's also tricky if you're just posting your resume on Monster or Dice. Um, so th I would say to answer your question, if you are posting your resume somewhere, then yes, list your, your objective. If you're applying for a very specific job, then list that specific job. Um, okay. Another thing that's not Thank my, you, you're welcome. Something that's not in my slides, but I'm a firm believer of is when you're listing your title and your resume from like, you know, I was a technical writer, a senior technical writer from 1995 to, you know, 1998. I'm a believer that you should list what you did, not what your title was. I know a lot of people who do technical writing as part of their jobs, but that's not their title, right? So maybe you, maybe you did both instructional design and technical writing, but your title was technical writer, but you're applying for an instructional design job. So if you just say technical, technical writer, technical writer for the past three jobs, I'll go, oh, you're not an instructional designer because don't forget, we don't have time to read all the bullets under every single job you have. We just don't have the time, we'll skim it. So if you are in a situation where you've done tech writing, but it's not your title, then put instructional, technical writer slash instructional designer or uh, member of technical staff slash technical writer. That way, when a recruiter reads your resume, they go tech writer, technical writer. Oh yeah, I see you've been a technical writer. Off you go. That's one way to get around that too. Now, if you're if you've got the interview, they're making a job offer, and you're filling out a job application, and it says title, well, that's where you list your title because if they do a, um, a background check on you, and they call the company to verify what your title was, then you want it to match exactly. Good questions. Any more? So, uh, Jack, um, I have a question, follow-up question to that. So on your resume, is it good to have both then? I mean, should you have an area where you list your, your job title and the time that you did that title and then have a different area that talks about uh, the list of skills or list of things that you did? Um, I, I'm just asking that because I don't know, uh, you know, if, if somebody has a gap in dates, for example, is that something that you check? Oh, God, I really need to do my resume presentation because um, I cover that. Um, what I had a time when I was laid off in the mid 90s. So um, instead of listing the dates, I said three years at this company and 1990 present doing this. And it kind of covered that gap. I also put a summary, a functional summary at the top of my resume going, here's the things I do as a technical writer. And by the way, here's where I did them. Um, and it kind of helped cover that gap, um, especially if you're unemployed now. So let me touch on this. Here's another datum. It's cold but true. If someone wants, if someone's looking for, I don't know, let's use technical writer, they want you to be doing it now, not four jobs ago. So you need to move your technical writing to the top of your resume as eloquently as possible. Also, if you are currently unemployed, 
you're not un unemployed, you're an independent contractor, all right? Go out and do, well, it's hard to do now because we can't, we're socially isolating, but reach out to some groups that you belong to and say, hey, do we have any policies and procedures that we need written up? Um, is there any strategic plans that we haven't written up? Um, uh, interview somebody for your local STC newsletter if you have one, if not, start one. And then once you do these, you can say from March 2020 to present, um, working on projects such as, or for organizations such as, so it shows that you're actually doing something, not sitting at the home, at home, watching TV, eating Del Monte cream peaches and heavy syrup. Okay. It's again, it's a way to yeah, maximize, um, that shows that you're actually doing something and not just, you know, doing nothing. Excellent point. Thank you. Sure. Um, so I had a question. I, I kind of agree with you about the domain knowledge. What I've been struggling with is that I don't have a scientific or technical background at all. And so I know English really well, but um, I actually, I find it difficult once I have the job to kind of learn on the job or do you recommend like I get some of that technical knowledge? Yes. Okay. I mean, it depends on any field you're in. Right. So, I mean, I know plenty of, excellent technical writers who have a degree in um uh, i think somebody on the call today has a degree in library sciences or worked as a yeah. librarian right now if i was applying for a technical writing job at a network company and my degree was in library sciences i would not list that at the top of my resume mm -hmm. right especially if some engineer is looking at your resume they'll think oh she couldn't possibly understand what we do here so um, that's actually uh, the next slide. No, I'll come back to that in a second, okay? Hold that thought. Okay. Any other questions about summary versus requirements? Because a lot of these questions I'm gonna cover in the next four slides. All right, let's press on. Oh, was there something? All right, let's press on. Okay, mistake number six, misnaming your resume. Remember, we get tens if not hundreds of resumes a day. Do you have any idea how many resume dot docs I get? Name your resume joejones.doc or preferably.pdf or joejonestechwriter.pdf. That way, um, if it gets separated from your email and it's in a folder of resumes, I can find you. I don't have to then search through 150 resumes dot pdf all right now this next thing is kind of a subset don't use odd email addresses joe jones at gmail.com is far more professional that happily buzzed at sugaryjunkie.org and lest you think that i am making this up i'm going to share some actual email addresses that people have used to apply for jobs I rearranged them so they're not, you know, actual emails um, for privacy's sake. No mango for you at hotmail.com. Okay, 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 53. Antlers at mrmoose.org. Kayakboy11. But I like this one, addicted to coffee at AOL. And a couple things down is real cranky at yahoo.com. First of all, who would hire somebody whose email address is real cranky? And secondly, just out of fun, I want to put real cranky and addicted to coffee in the same room at the same time just to see what would happen. Um, and some of these, uh, second to the left from the bottom, Ohio Chick 21 at excite.com. Okay. Um, little China Girl Colleen. To me, that's a potential sexual harassment lawsuit in the making. Um, in the middle on the second side, Sheep 13. Okay. First of all, TMI. And isn't it funny that there are 13 other sheep people out there before he had to use sheep 13? Oh, look at the next one, grammar whore at Yahoo. Who would hire somebody whose email address is grammar whore? Don't do that. Jack Molasani at gmail.com or better yet, Jack Molasani job search or Jack Molasani 2020 at 
um, whatever, because that way you can kill that email after you, you get your new job. Otherwise, you'll be getting emails from recruiters from here to eternity and spam from God knows where. So create a separate email address for your job search and use that and then kill the, kill the email, okay? All right, let's get back to our presentation. All right. Number seven, errors in your resume. Remember, your resume is the first sample of your writing skill and attention to detail. Hiring managers judge candidates based on their resumes and will disqualify you if they find errors in your resume. I used to say, used to say um, engineers can get away with typos, but technical writers cannot. I don't even believe it anymore. I submitted a programmer once and, uh, oh, hurry the hell up, has been taken, yes. So um, I submitted a uh, programmer once and the hiring manager came back to me because she had typos in her resume. And he said, listen, if she can't write two pages of error-free resume, how can I expect her to write 10,000 lines of error-free code? And it's true, especially if there's 10 applicants, three of them have flawless resumes and seven of them have um, typos. We're gonna look at the, the flawless ones first. Um, uh, also, um, this is not in the slide, but um, the most common error I see is a mix of n dashes and hyphens in your resume date ranges. If you, most people use Microsoft Word, Word tries to be helpful. Um, if you do space hyphen space, it'll turn into an n dash for you. And an n dash is a dash that's the width of a letter n. That's why it's called an n dash. And, um, and a hyphen is used to hyphenate word, like mother-in-law. So if you do space hyphen space, it turns into an n dash for you. But if you do space hyphen up arrow, it does not. So if you've been one of these people who've got a 20, been working on the same resume for 20 years, you are not going to see the errors in your resume. So first thing you do is give it to someone else to read. Um, and that's something I can offer as a way to give back to the chapter. That end at, the, at the end of the presentation is my um, email address. I'm happy to review anybody's resume and happy to keep it um, on file. And I do that as a free service. Um, I do do career coaching as a separate service, but resume review is free. Um, plus, I get to keep your resume and so I know where you are. Um, and then, but now, oddly enough, if you send me a resume applying for a job position, I I can't fix your resume or send it on. That would be unethical for me because now I'm no longer accurately representing you, right? Same thing, if I see a bunch of resumes and I ask you to fix them before submitting you, so it's a two-edged sword. Make sure someone re reviews your resume before you apply for the job because the minute you apply for that job, that write, your resume is a, a, a writing sample, a sample of your attention to detail. So make sure you have a flawless resume, zero defects. Again, harsh, but true. This next one I call misevaluation of performances. I've touched on this in a couple of times already. Highlight your strengths, minimize your weaknesses. Put the most applicable information at the top of your resume so you can be found. Um, a classic example of this is a company in Dallas wanted a tech writer with experience writing patent applications. And I found when I submitted them, and the hiring manager said, he doesn't have patent writing experience. I'm going, yes, he does. The problem is it was on the second page, second paragraph, second bullet. She just didn't read that far. Um, and he had a summary and he said, technical writer with 10 years experience writing, blah, blah, blah. He should have said technical writer with 10 years experience writing user manuals and patent applications. And then maybe she would have continued reading see where he did it, All right? And again, we talked about the thing. If you're applying for a job in your degree, is in that field, put that at the top. If your degree is in something totally different, maybe put that at the bottom, okay? Not anticipating questions. Recruiters will wonder about oddities in resumes, so be proactive and explain them. For example, gaps in your work history. Um, a friend of mine, um, let's take the third one, moving from contract to perm. A lot of people take contract jobs when they get laid off, and a lot of people will go back to perm as soon as they can. But if you've been a contractor for 30 years 
and you're applying for a perm position, I want to know why. Because having been a contractor, I'm used to getting in, doing a project, and leaving in three months. I don't care about office politics. I don't care about, you know, conforming to the norm. And I get bored. So if you've been doing short contracts for the past 30 years. I don't know. Are you going to be a good fit? On the other hand, I had a friend of mine who got a divorce, and it was more important to her to have uh, benefits for her children than to do contracting, which she enjoyed which was a very valid reason for moving from contract to firm. So again, if you have an oddity um, in your resume, explain it. Oh, let's take the second one now. Remember the Bozo email who accused me of being foreign born because like my last name was Malasani? I'm, I'm very hesitant to judge people in that way, right? But if your name is Angia Sengupta and your degree in Bay University, I want to know what your citizenship is um, or work visa status is. Um, I know a third generation Chinese American named Hung Wen. So on her resume, she just put Hung Wen, US citizen. Oh, good. Thank you. Now I don't have to ask. All right. Anything. Oh, if you're applying for a job out of state, well, is a spouse relocating there and you just want a job when you get there? Are you going to need relocation assistance? Um, Again, anytime there's an oddity that we're going to wonder about, just kind of be proactive and explain them in uh, your cover letter. Dear sir, um, we're relocating to Seattle in two months. Um, I'm applying for jobs ahead of time. I would be happy to do a Skype interview to start. Here's a summary of how my experience matches the job requirements. Okay. All right. Number 10. Are we doing on time? Nine minutes. Not keeping your skills current. Oh, my whatever. I have so many people that say, uh, oh, I can learn that in a weekend. I'm like, well, if you, have a, if you can learn it in a weekend, why haven't you? Um, there is nothing worse than losing a great job because someone else had a certain offering tool and you didn't. It also depends on if it's a contract. I mean, if it's a four-month contract, I don't have time to teach you FrameMaker. I don't have time to teach you structured authoring. Um, but if it's a full-time staff position, well, okay, then I might invest some stuff with you. And here's an example. I'm going to give you a couple examples on this. Um, I had a candidate who fell through. It was a, um, it was just updating some documentation in FrameMaker. He didn't know FrameMaker. So I said, well, um, grab your books, come over to the office. Um, we bought him a used copy of FrameMaker. I taught him the basics bullet list, numbered lists, how to format, character formatting, par paragraph forming, and stuff, which was all he really needed for this job. He went home, he created a bunch of examples. I sent him his resume and his examples to the hiring manager, and she hired him on Monday, all right? Now, I'm not saying lie. I'm not saying put something in your resume you don't have. Um, I'm just saying learn the latest tools. Give you another real life example. There was a, a job that required experience um, doing uh, conditional text in FrameMaker. That's when you use a variable and say, okay, we're printing this for, uh, like some of the cars are branded, like the Probe and the Mazda 626 was actually the same car, just sold by different companies. So you could just change that conditional text to say either Mazda or uh, or Ford. So um, they want her to have experience with conditional text. So she got a couple copy of FrameMaker, how to do conditional text, and then called her SDC buddies and said, hey, if it aren't conditional text, meet me on Saturday morning, bring your laptop. So they, she got the interview, and when the hiring manager says, do you know how to do conditional text? She goes, know how to do conditional text. Ah, oh, how to do conditional text, right? And she got the job. Um, now, she didn't say she's got 10 years experience doing it, but she knew how to do it, and well, that was sufficient for the job. So whatever industry you're in, whatever tools that are being used in your area, um, and the easy way to do this is do a job search on like Indeed or Dice or Monster for tech writers in your area and look at the job requirements and see if there's a tool that's coming up, up over and over again. Many companies still use Microsoft Word, that's fine. A lot of companies are using FrameMaker. Um, a lot of companies are moving to structured authoring and there's a bunch of um, things out there and standards like DITA which we talked about over lunch is the uh, a structured authoring um, tool. Look it up. 
um, just keep up with your um, your skills when possible. All right, so before I summarize, yeah, let me summarize and then we'll take, we got five minutes for more questions. One, follow submission directions. Two, use good internet manners. Name your resume so it can be found. Use a professional email address. Have a flawless resume. Highlight your strengths, minimize your weaknesses, keep your skills current, and include a summary of how your experience and skills match the job requirements. And I'm gonna update the summary with another bullet that says, skip the applicant tracking system and uh, find a real person to talk to, okay? All right, so again, here's my email address. Um, if your company is hiring and you need a contract or a perm writer, I can help you too. Um, and I also produce a conference on digital publishing that uh, takes place in October in New Orleans. We've got seven and a half a month. Let's pray things um, calm down by then. Um, like the STC Summit, I would prefer a hybrid. We've been doing a virtual track for years. So I, I could do a virtual conference, not the same as in person. Let's maybe do a, a conference with social distancing. We'll see. Um, either way, it's gonna happen, whether it's person or online. So I'm gonna leave that splash screen there for now. Let's open the, the call for more questions. I have a, I have a couple of them. Um, so you were talking about keeping skills current. Uh, one of the things is like, how, how do you decide, you know, which, there's so many different types of software and technology out there. How do you decide like which application and everything will be of best use to you given that, you know, it takes a certain amount of time and investment to, to become familiar with each one? Yep. Again, I would search for companies in your area. Um, like if you're in a, an industrial area, they're not doing a lot of online help. So it doesn't really, you know, they may prefer you have like an illustrator tool, like um, Adobe Illustrator. Um, so find jobs in your area and then get a prop, copy of that and then practice, practice, practice. And again, if you can get real live examples um, for your other organizations, just stay away from religious and political organizations because that's too polarizing right now. Um, but find some group, Save the Bay, Habitat for Humanity, surely they would need illustrations if um, you're in an area that's doing construction. So just look for jobs in your area and see what's most popular. Um, and I guess the other question I had, I, well, I guess this probably fits in with the uh, the volunteer stuff, but uh, you know, I, I'm pretty new to the industry and everything myself. Um, you know, it, it, most jobs are asking for significant amounts of experience that uh, I'm not really having. So how do you, I guess what Kate's saying, you know, basically, can you use the volunteer jobs as work experience in this case? Yes, you can. And we are out of time. I'm already over. I just realized that there's only two minutes to let the next speaker get lined up. If you have any questions, reach out to me. Um, um, send me an email. I promise to follow up. I'm pretty good that way. But again, thank you, everybody, for inviting me. I had fun here. I hope you guys did, too. Thank you, Jack. Uh, also, speaking of volunteering, that's <laughs> what our next presentation is about. Uh, so, hold on. Oops. Okay, Shri, I'm making you the presenter. Great.